have today with us Andrea Anderson with the title of Just Add Adventure. So Andrea Anderson is a mom to three teens, the oldest which has Down syndrome. She's the past president of both oh, the Down my Association there. of Hampton Roads and the Arc of South Hampton Roads, as well as the 2011 graduate of the Partners in Policymaking Program. Her role at Support Services of Virginia, she leads the accounting department. In her free time, you can likely find her outside mountain biking, trekking, paddling, rock climbing, scuba diving, and adventure racing are some of her favorite ways to get out there and push her limits. So without further ado, Andrea Anderson. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and guess what? I have never done this before. The ARC asked for experienced speakers, and I applied. <laughs> so, um, and Chip is my uh, life partner, I guess you'd call him. Um, great friend and usually a leader in my personal life and my professional life. He owns Support Services of Virginia, and he encouraged me to do this as well. And when he speaks, I usually think, oh, I wish he'd mentioned that I'm a parent and I have kids that are a really important part of my life. Uh, so usually that kind of um, doesn't get mixed in with his presentations. So I'm glad to get to speak today, and I want to get to know you better. Um, but not in the typical way. I think I'm just going to assume that you are all either people with disabilities or your family members or you are service providers. Uh, so I'm going to make that assumption. I'm also going to assume that we all believe in the same things that the ARC believes, that people with disabilities should be included everywhere they go, anywhere they go. Um, and so the other thing I want to say is I consider you guys family. So has anyone read the book Far From the Tree? It's by Andrew Solomon, and he talks about when the apple does fall far from the tree, if you know what I'm saying. So when I had a child with Down syndrome, my son might have less in common with me than he might have with others in his same circumstance. So me becoming a parent of a child with a disability also kind of put me a little farther from the tree than my parents and my grandparents. So I looked to people like you and came to things like this um, to find out what my life was going to look like, what I could and would like to expect. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. That's the assumptions I'm making. So what I want to learn about you is how adventurous you are. And uh, I want, by raise, raising your hand, who has done something adventurous in their lifetime? Is there anyone who thinks they haven't done something adventurous? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone who uh, doesn't want to raise their hand? <laughs> who said no? You, this is for you. <laughs> this is a magnet. It says just add adventure. And um, I'm glad you spoke up. Maybe by the end of the session, you'll think of something that you did do that was adventurous. Um, but that's just a little reminder for your fridge to just add adventure. There's a picture on it. It's of Sharp Top Mountain. That's one of the peaks of Otter in Virginia. Uh, it's a really cool place. I took my family there after having gone there with Chip. And they have a shuttle that goes from the bottom of the mountain to about um, 1,500 meters to the top. So it takes you most of the way up there, and then you've got a 1,500-meter hike. That's fairly st strenuous, a little more than I had um, wanted it to be. Um, but we did all make it, and so the picture on the magnet will show a beautiful thing. And there's a staircase on it. And you know, everything I've ever done is by just taking the next step. So I'm not going to tell you anything surprising, probably, because that's everything in a nutshell. Go do something, you know, take the steps. And um, so, not all of you are adventurous or self-proclaimed. How many of you have done something adventurous within the last 10 years? Awesome. How many in the last five years? Still a lot of hands. How many within the last year? All right. Okay, we're getting down to months. How many have done something adventurous in the last six months? Last three months? Last two months? Last month? Last week? Whew, there's still some hands. How about within the last three days? 
Uh, raise them high if it's the last three days. Okay, three people have done something adventurous in the last three days. How am I going to pick which one of you to share? Do any one of you three want to share what you did in the last three days that's adventurous? You don't want to share, you'll get a magnet. <laughs> Lily, would you like to share? Awesome! Yeah. <laughs> well, you pass this back to Lily. <laughs> Thank you for speaking up and sharing your adventure. She took the back roads. I think that's pretty adventurous, too. And then, you know, add to adventure, I've taken the back roads and I've driven a cargo van while doing it on those back roads. Whew, that was pretty scary. Um, well, now I have an idea for how adventurous you are. And like I said, I'm probably not going to tell you anything surprising. And uh, just a caveat, I am not going to tell you how to find more time or make more money or get better help. You need all those things. There's, what can you say? I don't know. I can't tell you those things. Um, but this is what I do want to cover today. It's the W questions. What, who, why, how to get adventure in your life. Um, I'm going to start with uh, what it is. Um, so I'm going to define adventure for us all so we can have a common understanding of what it is. We're going to determine why it's important to have it in your life. We're going to determine who it's important for. I bet you could probably already answer that. What do you think the answer to that is? Everyone. Everyone. Okay. Uh, and we're going to have some strategies for adding adventure. Um, I just added a slide here of Trey. This is my son probably, probably five years ago. This is at Lake Chirondo. We went camping there. Has anyone been to Lake Chirondo? It's a great, beautiful place. Beautiful lake. It's got a little island that you can swim out to. No Wi-Fi service. None. Great. Unless you're my son, Trey. And we had gotten there, and we set up our tent, and we did everything. It was just him and I. It was going to be just a mom-son trip, because sometimes it's hard to handle everyone's expectations. So it was just him and I. And we'd done everything we'd set out to do. We made dinner. We did the campfire. We did it all. And the sun's going down, and he's afraid of the dark. And whew, he starts a little bit melting down, and not in a quiet way. So of course, all the campgrounds around us are hearing this. And um, luckily, someone across the way said, hey, did you know there's movies that play on Saturday nights? And it starts at such and such time. I'm like, oh. I didn't realize that. I'm so glad you told me. Thanks for the help. So even though we had at least half an hour to wait, Trey was more than willing. He got front row seats. We also had, of course, the other staple in our lives is goldfish crackers. So anyway, that's just a short one of the adventures we've had. Um, but sometimes, you know, I wonder, like, who do I think I am? <laughs> we have seen some great speakers today. Kathy Snow and David Petoniak I saw when I was in Partners in Policymaking, and such wonderful speakers, loads of experience, and I think I don't know if I have anything valuable to say. Um, so I want to tell you, and what made me think of this is a video by Matthew McConaughey that's been going around. I don't know if you've seen it, but he was like saying, you know, you need to figure out who you're not, and don't be who you're not. Well, I'm going to show you some people that I'm not. I'm not this person. Does anyone know who it is? This is Alex Honnold. I know Chip is keeping his mouth shut because I know he knows this is Alex Honnold. That's called the Heaven Wall, and he's climbing in Yosemite. He's about 3,000 feet off the ground with no ropes. So I'm never going to be that person. I'm never going to be famous. I'm not that much of a risk taker. I'm also not this person, which would shock me if you know who he is. That's who I wanted to be. I am not always successful either. He uh, is a person I beat out of an audition on the clarinet in 1991. And he went on to be the principal clarinetist of the Cincinnati Symphony. He's now a professor of clarinet at the University of Texas. But anyway, I'm not him. I didn't make it. I'm also not this person. <laughs> wow. This, <laughs> this is Rebecca Hartman. I went to high school with her. Um, I got in touch with her through Facebook because she heard I had a son with a disability. And it turns out she has a son with autism. And around the time I started being Facebook friends with her, she decided it was important to her to become a swimsuit model. 
She did it. She's my age. She started around 40. She's an NSL pro. Not really sure what that means, but she posts pictures of her in these, you know, cute little bikinis. And I'm like, wow, how'd she do that? But not only that, her whole family, they're all <laughs> models. And so, so her, her son with autism, um, he also competes. So I'm not these people. I'm not a super mom either. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Well, maybe you could. You should put that on your dream list. You could do it. Um, so, but, so why should I be the one to deliver this message of adding adventure? You know, I'm none of these people, um, but this is why. That's me. And you know what? My inner child says I've come a long way. And I have. I mean, look at me. I was a um, shy, nerdy child. I was not athletic. I might have been a risk taker because look at the glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's who I am inside. My inner child is saying, you shouldn't do this. It's not going to be perfect. Like, you know, what were you thinking? Anyway, I talk to my inner child a lot, and that's who she is. I come a long way, so that's why I'm the person to deliver this to you. If your inner child is anything like this, you, could, you can do anything you want. And the other reason is because this is my son. Uh, his inner child is actually a little bit like mine. He's a little bit shy, and he doesn't like to be out of his comfort zone, but he loves being in the limelight. So how am I going to get this child, who's a little bit like me, to the limelight? Because that's where he really loves to be. Um, apparently, I do too. I'm up here. <laughs> I'm trying it out myself. Um, and this was in sixth grade. We're about the same age in this photo. He just turned 18 over the weekend, and we had a birthday party for him. And one thing that I did that was a little bit out of my comfort zone was I invited some friends of his that I didn't know them. Wow, I guess that's not strange for typical children. I don't know a lot of my daughter's friends. They're 13 and 15. I don't know their names. I don't know their faces. I don't even care. But for some reason, to me, inviting kids to my son's birthday party that I didn't know was a little bit scarier. But I did. I invited them. And there they are. There's Trey now. This was just over the weekend. And it was a big deal for him to become an adult. I think he thought it, he would change overnight. Um, We'll see how, what he thinks of that, but he did have a great time, and I was really glad to meet some of his friends. Um, this is a Beach Buddies Club. He is not included in every bit of high school. He was in elementary school. He was in some of middle school. High school, we're working on job skills. Um, I don't know. It, it's up to you. It's up to him. It's make your way the best way you can. And uh, his Beach Buddies Club, they come... Uh, I think it's once a month after school they meet. And they do other things. That's why I think once a month. But obviously, they came to his birthday over the summer. You know, this isn't school time. This isn't something that they get volunteer hours for. This they came because they actually like him. They, we had a little trivia time of things to know about Trey. And quite a few of them knew a lot of things that I was kind of surprised they knew. So it was just a lot of fun. So that's why I'm telling you this message. And we need to get to what I said we were going to talk about. I wonder what time it is. <laughs> Almost 4.30. OK, so the definition of adventure. You know, we used to Webster it. Now we Google it. By definition, adventure is an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity. Who's going to remember that? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but I think there are certain components to adventure. And um, I did a little bit of research. Some people might agree with this, and I don't, I don't know who doesn't, who really cares. But I think there's four, four components. The first one is this, risk. If, if you are having an adventure, you're risking something. And um, I think everyone deserves to be able to take a risk. I'll leave it at that for now. I think there needs to be an uncertain outcome. It can't be something you do every day where I'm going to go to work today and I'm pretty sure I'm going to actually end up at work. <laughs> That's not very uncertain. 
you have to have a total commitment. Like this is not, uh, well, I might do this, I might do that. It's like, no, I have to intentionally do this and I'm, I'm going to do it. Um, and the last thing, a high endeavor. Like it can't just be, like I said, going to work every day. It's not that high of a, a, a goal to achieve. It needs to be something, maybe something that scares you. So I think that's why adventure is a little bit different for all of us. It's really specific to the person. For me, an adventure is going to Africa for an adventure race that's six days long. That's what Chip was talking about. That's our next biggest, greatest challenge. Um, I might actually be a little more afraid for this than that. <laughs> but I don't know. That's about a month away. But so I want to just take a minute to decide um, if we think coming to the ARC convention was an adventure. So how many of you think coming to the ARC, Arc, Arc convention was an adventure for you? It was for me. There's a few of us. Okay, well, let's see if it fits the bill. Um, so was it a risk for you? Have you ever been to the convention before? Is there anyone here who hasn't been to the convention before? Oh, lots of people. Maybe because it was in Harrisonburg. I don't know. So that, that might make it a risk for you. For me, it was a risk because I've never spoken to an audience before. No brainer. Um, is there an uncertain outcome? I guess if you haven't come before, you um, might not know what to expect. For me, I've come to this convention nine years in a row. So I feel like I know what to expect. I see a lot of the same people, a lot of new people, but the feeling is the same. Like we're all very accepting of each other. You can talk to anybody. A lot of people offer support to each other. Um, it's a great environment. No uncertain outcomes. Uh, total commitment, that might be all of us. We had to take the time, the money, the resources to get here. But the high endeavor, was it anyone consider it a high endeavor for them and want to share why? You want to share why? That is a high endeavor. <laughs> Would you like a magnet? <laughs> um, yeah, so again, for me, it's an adventure because it's something I haven't tried before. Um, and, you know, we'll just see how it goes. Um, so I want to do something um, just so you guys can get talking to each other. And um, I want you to pair up with another person. I want you to tell them about one of the adventures in your life that was the most impactful. Um, go as deep as you want. Maybe it's only something that you had to wear a helmet for. Or maybe it's something that you really prepared for a long time to do. Um, so I'm going to give you five minutes. I want you to talk to one other person. Um, and then we'll see who wants to share. <laughs> go. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about your adventures. This is my grandpa. For um, what have I? His party tricks was, you have a bike? <laughs> yeah, well, I can ride it backward. And that is, uh, he was 73 in that picture. He's 93 now. <laughs> anyway, it was an adventure just watching him do that. That was when he was 73. Oof. Anyway, um, so I want you to think about what your partner told you and what about it made it an adventure for that person. I want you to think about if it had those four components. If it had the risk, the uncertain outcome, the total commitment, and the high endeavor, and what did they get out of it? So you're, you're thinking about the other person's adventure. And uh, I should have asked you to ask them if they felt it was okay for you to share it. But is there anyone who would like to share what uh, their partner's most impactful adventure was? and how it fit with what we're talking about. Does anybody feel comfortable sharing someone else's adventure? <laughs> All right, Catherine. My partner, Catherine, um, her greatest adventure was giving birth and raising her son who has autism and going from being told that he could not do anything and that her husband would leave her and she'd feel lonely and lonely to raising a child who's in college Awesome. Her, her risk was a child that has something that she's not familiar with and being able to be uncertain about everything in it. Yeah. 
I totally relate, relate to that. I should give Magnus to both of you. So I asked for you to share your partner's um, adventure because sometimes it's easier for someone else to talk for you than for you to talk for yourself. I don't know. Has anyone else felt that before? And does anyone else want to share? Would anyone like to share their own adventure? Awesome. I love it. Okay. So I totally love what you've done. I think you could be the one here. I want to come to your next your session next year. Because that's, that's a lot of adventure. That's a lot of adventure right there. You didn't even need that magnet that says just add adventure because you have enough. Um, but, but hopefully uh, that will get your, your juices flowing about what's adventure to you and why or how it's important. I'm going to tell you one of my uh, most impactful adventures. Um, and it started with Backpacker Magazine uh, and YouTube and Chip. And we've got this opportunity to uh, drive. And we decide we're going to Yosemite. had never been there. Um, awesome, awesome place. I hope everyone gets to see Yosemite someday. Uh, so Backpacker Magazine had this on the front cover. This is Cathedral Peak. This is... Um, you know, a 10,000 foot mountain. The rock climbing part of it, the prominence, is 900 feet. And we were, you know, not exactly new to rock climbing, but, um, you know, we've never been more than intermediate. And that's something I want you to know that if you're thinking of doing something adventurous or active or sports related, there is usually an entry level for everything. Uh, and you don't even necessarily have to get much better than that entry level to enjoy it. Um, so rock climbing, you know, there's, there's a lot of rock climbing gyms, and they'll rate them from 5.4 to 5.13 BC or whatever. You know, it gets really, really complicated. But there's something for everybody, and you can enjoy it, even if you're not, like, the best at it ever. So anyway, we're like, we're, we're not too bad. We're going to go rock climbing. And um, we think, you know, we saw this video on YouTube. The guy makes it look really easy. <laughs> and, um, you know, the guy in the YouTube video is not even using ropes. I'm like, ah, oh, well, then we're going to use ropes. It's going to be really easy. Well, uh, the rock climbing that is done at this, at this particular mountain is trad climbing. And trad climbing is short for traditional climbing. So what that means is you're going to have a lead climber, and they are going to go first. They're going to be connected to a second climber with a rope, and uh, they're going to go first. They're going to go up the mountain, and um, when you have trad climbing, there are no bolts and things to lock into. You're going to put your own gear in place. And this is one of the things we used that day. I brought it because I think show and tell is fun, and I'm going to pass these around. Um, so, you know, you pull it and you stick it in the crevice in the rock, and it creates the tension to push out and hold you in place. Uh, when you get that in between the rock, you connect your quick draw to that. You clip your rope through that, and you're hanging by this. So. Uh, I don't know, but I can't remember. I, it's something like a car, <laughs> something like you could hang a car from it. But it does matter that you positioned this correctly in the first place. And so you climb about as far as you're comfortable, which is, you know, between 15 and 20 feet. Maybe if you're a great climber, you go further. But you put in your protection and uh, you put the rope in. So then if you fall, you've got one that protects you. You keep going until you run out of rope, essentially. And so then when you run out of rope, that's when the person that got you up that far, they set up an anchor. Um, and then it switches, and then the lead person, while they're up at the top and they've got the anchor set, the person following will climb, 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 until they get to one of these. They take it off. They put it on their harness. They put the, the cam on their harness. And they collect all the gear until they get up to the lead climber at the, at the anchor. So this is the type of climbing we were doing that day. Um, tricky. 
and I, I'm not a lead climber. I leave that to Chip. He's smart and strong and braver than I am. Uh, so I'm going to pass these around. This is a, a cam. This is a nut. It acts the same, but it doesn't have any um, spring mechanism. You put it in a crack and you put the quick draw. Um, so you can just, you can feel these. It's, I, like I said, I think it's kind of fun. I'm going to going to pass that around that side and I have another set. These are the small ones. This is an itty bitty little cam. No way, that's going to hold my big body. And you know. look at this tiny, teeny little um, nut. I'm going to pass that around that way just so you can take a look. Oh, I should have said that the um, follower has to, sometimes it's hard to get those out because you want it to be in a really good secure position. So um, to get them out, sometimes you need some tools. So you can kind of uh, knock these out of the way. Here's a little hammer that we would carry um, on our harness. Um, I'm not going to pass it around. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but you get the idea. So on uh, Cathedral Peak, I want you to envision being where we were. Uh, so we're on Cathedral Peak. This is my actual picture. Looks a little different than the magazine cover. Um, but I want you to imagine sitting on a ledge. It's about, I don't know, 10 to 12 inches wide, not quite wide enough to be comfortable, and it's a little bit on a slant. And um, you've just had the discussion that things are taking a little longer than they should. It's a little bit harder than we thought it would be. We're a little bit off track. Um, we getting a little worried that the sun is setting and, um, you know, you look up to the right, there's this jaggedy, beautiful ridge line. Look all the way out, there's mountains as far as you could see, like, no people. Like, wow, we only saw two other people that day. And if you look down, you're about, let's say, four or 500 feet from the ground. You can see that far. You can see the little tiny trees. If there were people, they'd be like little ants. Uh, the only two we saw left before us, and we never saw them again that day. And we had this discussion, uh, wow, things aren't going quite right. But you look out on the horizon, and it's really dark gray. We started feeling raindrops. We started remembering from the research we'd done that Cathedral Peak is a natural lightning rod. It's a spire. So it's sticking right out of the earth saying, come hit me. Um, so we had read about that. And you climbed it. Well, <laughs> yes. But when we started, it was a beautiful day, and things always go our way, right? Mm -hmm. Well, not really. And so I think, you know, one component of adventure that I don't think is a necessary component, but I think Chip might argue about that, is that it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. <laughs> when you shared your adventure, did you have some adversity that you had to overcome? Yes. yes. Like that kind of makes it epic. Like, huh, I had to, you know, something went wrong. So that might be an unofficial component of adventure. Um, so we're sitting there. It's raining. And we decide this is critical. It's no longer fun. It's not what we had in mind. It's serious. This is life or death. We actually put our cameras away. Uh, we put the GoPro away. This is the last picture we took. And I remember thinking, this can't be it. Not going to happen. He starts climbing. Um, you know, I hear him kind of grunting and, you know, the sounds you don't want to hear because you know you're going to have to do it next and you're not as strong. And uh, he's grunting. And, you know, when you're rock climbing, you've got to be really clear in your communication because you're either yelling or... Um, you know, there's wind that takes your voice away. So when something gets hard or we think we might fall, um, we use the word sketch. So Chip says sketch, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready for him to fall. I'm ready, you know. It's like just to get ready. It's not like, you know, we've got the protection, so a fall is okay, um, but we're just getting ready for it. So I'd heard him have a hard time with this pitch, um, and we already know we've, we've already gotten serious. But like I said, we're not having fun anymore. This is not fun. Not fun. And he's, uh, he tells me he's off belay. So I don't have to worry about the rope anymore. He's at the next anchor point. He's climbed all the way to the next point. 
And so I just have to sit there and wait to hear that it's time for me to climb. That took forever. I don't know how long in real life it took. Five minutes, half an hour. How long do you think it took? Okay. In my mind, it was like an hour. I had all these thoughts, like, why am I doing this? What have I done? I've got my beautiful children. Seriously. I'm like, my purpose in life is not to climb this rock. It's my children. I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to tell them. I blah, 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 blah. Started having these feelings of, you know, a little bit of panic, a little bit of like, whew, I'm overwhelmed. But then, you know, you're in the moment. You, you do what you have to do. I think, you know, when I had a child with Down syndrome, you know, people tell me, oh, you know, it's um, God gave you Trey because you're the one, you know, you're going to be the best, whatever. Like, no, I have done what I have to do. And, you know, you get yourself in certain situations where there's not a choice about it. You're going to have to go through it, and you want to go through it as best you can. So here we are in this situation. Um, you know, I am going to have to get there. I had this clarity that I am getting off of this mountain. <laughs> you know, so that's where I was. Um, and I think the emotional process of that is really what's key to adventure. Um, so like I said, I was feeling scared, obviously. Were there any other feelings that you could have, you imagined while you were putting yourself in my shoes? Panic. Say what? Terrified. Yeah, terrified. Adrenaline. Adrenaline. What else did I say? I felt stupid. What was I doing? I had kids. <laughs> what was I doing? And, you know, I felt like maybe we bit off more than we should chew. I was overwhelmed, panicked, helpless, anxious. I was mad. I was mad at myself. I was mad at the weather. I was, <laughs> I was mad at all sorts of things, you know. And I'm like, you know, it's just not helpful. So, you know, in that process, you got to go somewhere with it. So I calmed down. Uh, we just kept going. Like I said, all of that angst and anxiety, it, it wasn't an option to have it. Like, if I was going to survive, I'm not going to do that. I have to move on. But I did have that time where I was just waiting feeling like this might be it. So the waiting was really difficult for me. Um, but then it turned to determination, and I started feeling resolved, like we're doing this. I got focused, hyper-focused almost. Like I remember the next pitch, like I did not think about a thing. The part where Chip had a hard time where I knew where it was, it was an overhang, it's usually the hardest moves to make, I had no problem. I was so strong. I couldn't believe how strong I was. I really couldn't. Um, and I took the gear out, no problem. I don't know if I needed to use the tools, but I was, I was stronger than ever. I was calm. I was hopeful, actually. It's like, well, you know, I've got to do this. I was mindful. I was attentive. I was skilled. I started to be in a state of flow. And if you've heard anyone talk about this, I think Tony Hawk probably has been an example for that skateboarder. But, you know, like when you're doing something that you really love, that you're pretty good at, like time goes away and you just do it and it's like an enjoyment. Um, I started having that where I was just like, dude, I'm just doing what I know how to do. I'm doing what I practice. I like, and I'm doing it good. You know, I was in a state of flow. And I felt purposeful. Like, I felt like all of a sudden I have a purpose in life. I usually feel that way anyway. I mean, as, especially as a parent, you know, you, you're almost given a purpose the second you have a child. So I, I often feel that way. But this made it crystal clear. Like, not only, you know, do I have to be a parent, I want to be. I can't wait to see my kids again. I want them to hear about my experience. I want to be an example for them. Um, I felt purposeful. And as a result, all of that, we, we did the climb. We got to, oh, I forgot this part of it. In, we left some gear at the bottom uh, so that we could lighten our load. And in that gear, I left my regular glasses. I had been wearing sunglasses that were prescription. I've worn glasses since I was three or four. So I was wearing sunglasses. My regular glasses were down at the bottom. The sun was setting. And I'm like, I don't have... I can't wear my sunglasses anymore. My regular glasses are at the bottom. We had to find a place to repel because when you do multi-pitches, 
you can't just repel from anywhere because your rope's not long enough. So we get to a place where um, Chip thinks the rope is going to reach. And um, <laughs> it's, it's like a, you, put, you basically bend the rope in half over something that's going to hold, is what he did. It's, it's, a, it's not abnormal. Um, but to me, it was like, oh my goodness. So he puts the rope over, and you know, he always goes first for us. Thank goodness someone goes first for me, because I, I need someone to go before me. And, uh, <laughs> but we have to agree on what's safe or not. And I kept thinking that rope is going to slide off because it's basically sitting there. Like if the, if the pressure went the wrong way, it would like fall off. And I'd be like stuck up there. Like forget that he would fall. I'd be stuck up there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I put on an extra tether. Uh, actually, I guess I brought that too. But I put this tether across another rock with a quick draw over the rope. And Chip thought it was kind of ridiculous. But in my mind, I was like, that's going to save us. And it's kind of one of the cardinal rules like you should never break is to leave gear. Um, one, because it's expensive, but also because it's, you know, littering essentially. Like if you left your gear up there, like, well, it saved my life, you know, however much it was. We left two pieces of gear. But he went down and I took off my glasses and there I go. I couldn't see much of anything. We had to boulder back down. By this time, you know, the sun had set. We got down. I, we had a two or three hour hike back to the car. We didn't get back to the car until one in the morning. Wow. You know, Yosemite is bare central. Um, so we made it, though. <laughs> Yay! Uh, and guess how I felt then? I felt really proud. I went from stupid to proud. I'm telling you this story. Like, wow. <laughs> Uh, I also felt um, relieved, Whew. great feelings. I felt grateful, was so just dang grateful to be alive, to be you know, able to call my kids. I felt grateful for my partner, for the beauty of the world. You know, you just have this great epiphany. I felt fulfilled, amazed, empowered, excited, connected, energized, motivated, joyful. I felt invincible. Who does not want to feel that way? Who has a right to feel that way? All of us. I think that you can't really simulate that. Like, you can't just make it up. You have to go through a process, an emotional process. Um, I've seen my kids go through this. I've tried to simulate some experiences so that they have to go through this. Um, this is Trey. This is one of those simulated experiences <laughs> where we went zip lining. And, um, this was a, a great place to go zip lining. It was in Asheville, North Carolina. I would highly recommend it. It has the fastest zip line in the country. I think it, you get up to 70 miles an hour or something like that. And the zip line itself is three quarters of a mile long. But, but what made this zip line doable for us is that there was a five point harness. Some places you go, it's a small harness. Trey doesn't have a lot of upper body strength. So five-point harness. Uh, a lot of zip line places, they're adventure parks. So you have to kind of um, do little walkways to the next tree or something like that. You've got to have a lot of balance or something. That's not one of his strong points. So this place had a mountaintop adventure where you hike to the next zip line. You don't have to do it in, in the air. You don't have to have balance. You have to have a little bit of endurance, which was really hard for him. I'm going to show you a video in a minute of him doing that. Um, but he was pretty scared to do this. My daughters were psyched. They were excited. So like the whole family, we found something that the whole family was excited for. He was excited, but he was scared. And we got to, it's called Navitat. I don't know if I said it right. But we got there, and he immediately needs to go to the bathroom. Like, oh no, <laughs> he's never going to come out. <laughs> and uh, about 20 minutes later, when it's about our turn to go get suited up, I'm like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? We're in public. It's a men's restroom. He's an adult. I'm not, I can't go in there anymore like I used to, or I can't bring him with me. Um, I did ask someone to go check to see if he was sick or something. 
And it was one of the workers. They were happy to do it. They came back out, said he's fine. A few minutes later, he came out. Uh, long story short, he did it. It was hard, but I think he went through some of these emotions. And the video uh, that I want to show you, um, did I have that next? No, I don't. Well, it's coming. <laughs> but I think that emotional process is a lot like the process that um, I've read about in Martha Beck's books. Does anybody know who Martha Beck is? No. Well, no. Oh, okay, awesome. <laughs> awesome. I wish I could. Um, so Martha Beck has a son with Down syndrome, but she's an author. She's a life coach. She writes articles for Oprah Magazine. Um, her book that she wrote was called Expecting Adam, but the books I've enjoyed the most are um, Steering by Starlight and Finding Your Own North Star. Anyway, she's a life coach. And she, I felt like the process I went through on Cathedral Peak and the process that Trey went through at Navitat um, Zipline um, was this going through the ring of fire. Have you ever felt like you went through the ring of fire? Like, what even is that? Um, well, this is how she describes it. She describes this outer circle as the shallows, like where we all spend most of our time. Like we're worried about material reality, like what am I going to wear, what am I going to eat? You know, just the stuff that matters a little bit, but not that much. And then when you're, something happens, <laughs> you know, either planned or not planned, you might have to go through the ring of fire. And the ring of fire is the emotional process that we go through to reach the core of peace. So sometimes the thing that puts you in the ring of fire is by choice. Sometimes it's not by choice. Um, but to get to the ring of fire, you've got to go, to get to the core of peace, you have to go through this ring of fire. And she calls the core of peace, well, she says, describes it as connection and fulfillment. And I think that's absolutely true. All of those feelings that I went through, that I listed, that you can imagine going through, I'm sure, um, led to this feeling of connection and fulfillment. Uh, so I don't think that that is, you know, just for people who do not have disabilities. We all have to go through the ring of fire, and, and a lot of us have to go through bec even if we don't want to. Um, I took this picture because I think this tree is a really great example of um, developing character. This tree has a lot of character, and I think, um, Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. I love that quote. And does anyone know who said this? No. And who thinks that someone without a disability said this? I kind of set you up. Who thinks someone with a disability said this? Yes, there's someone with a disability that said this, and you're going to know who it is. Helen Keller said this. Someone with a, a lot of adversity in her life. She probably went through the ring of fire, I don't know how many times, every day. Uh, so, oh gosh, I keep thinking that video is going to come up, but I put this first. Uh, I think the ring of fire is also a lot like the change cycle. It's also like the process we go through an adventure so we're going to have these things in our lives that are catalysts these things that you know come along because we want to do them or we don't want to do them they can be planned or unexpected um, and this is usually the first thing that starts us in this first quadrant of the change cycle this is again from Martha Beck so we all have change we go through change is a part of life a lot of us don't like it I don't like it much at all um, but this death and rebirth is when something really comes in your way that changes your life. Could be something like a loved one passes away. Um, maybe you change jobs. Maybe you get divorced. Been there. It's hard. There's a death. There's a rebirth. Um, even though it was my choice, planned, it's hard. It's a change of life. Um, but it's very similar to the adventure process, to going through the ring of fire. And the next part of the change cycle, when you're in the second one, you're dreaming and you're scheming. You're like, ah, I've got this change in my life. Now what should I do? I've got to plan things out. And 
then you have the hero, so hero saga. You start trying these things out. You see, what, what is it? You know, like, I decided my dreams were this. I'm going to go try them out. And, you know, you have ups and downs. Sometimes you have great days, sometimes you don't. But you're trying to get to the promised land where you've done all this work. And then you come to this great place where, you know, I was working towards getting a job, and now I've got a job. I'm in the promised land. But guess what? You might not stay there very long. Or maybe you will. It depends on if you want to or if something unexpected happens. So this change cycle is not, um, sometimes it's not by choice. And like I said, it's for all of us. We all have to go through a lot of change. And Martha Beck points out that some people like a certain part of the change cycle better than others. Like I've, I know a lot of people, not a lot. I know one in particular that's a great dreamer and schemer. And it's Chip. Uh, he, you know, at our company is the visionary in our company. And he just always has so many ideas. I say he's like putting an octopus to bed. Like all of his arms, like, but this, but that, but this, but that. And you're trying to tuck him in. Like, no, those people are, they love that part of the change cycle. They might not even ever go to, to doing all the things they think of that could be done because they like it. So they might need help coming along to the next, you know, well, let's try some of these things out to see if we can actually get to the goal, you know. So it, it's a cycle, and it, I think we all go through this. My kids are going to have to go through this. Can you think of any scenarios of that um, catalytic event, just something that changes your life? Can you think of any other example that people go through? Anything you've gone through? Having a child, an illness, yeah, addiction, yeah, um, accidents. Accident. What about a change that you want to happen? That you you say, okay, I'm going to have a change in my life. Marriage. Marriage. Jobs. Jobs. Divorce. Did you say divorce? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Moving to a new place, yeah, totally. So anyway, I think it's interesting to look at change from a cycle because uh, it kind of gives you a, a path, you know, what you're thinking. And it can go on and on and on. Okay, so this is the video I wanted to show you. How much time? Oh, I got 20 minutes. It's a, it's a pretty short video, but this is an Avitat. This is when I thought, you know, I wasn't sure if Trey would do well or like it or not. I don't know. I want to hear this. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, so the reason I wanted you to hear that is because I think it, 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 you can hear the emotion, the, the connection. And I tell you, Trey didn't talk till he was really pretty old. He had some sign language, um, but it took him a long time to say, I love you, Mom. Probably, he was probably seven years old. I think my daughters said that when they were around two. So to me, it's like, 
wow, he, he had that connection, he had that fulfillment, and, you know, it was a simulated adventure, but he really was quite scared, uh, and he pushed his limits that day. So just to recap that, why adventure is important, uh, because it builds your adversity skills, gives you opportunities to practice them, it instills confidence and provides something to be proud of, and uh, I think to inspire others. Uh, I know it's a little bit controversial, you know, like should we be putting our kids out there uh, to be inspirations to others? Um, I think, you know, sometimes if you don't see what's possible, you don't know what's possible. So uh, I, I put myself out there a lot too, and kind of thanks to Chip, uh, we have a a lot of videos we put together about our racing. I put together videos about my family, uh, mostly to share with our family because they're in Colorado and that's how we keep in touch with each other. You know, this is what we did, look. So um, anyway, I, I want to wow. say what? Awesome. <laughs> Don't worry about that part. Awesome. Ah, thanks. Well, uh, <laughs> anyway, just a couple more adventures. Trey, th that picture is him walking to the mailbox for the first time. It was a it was in a townhouse where we lived. He had to walk down the block and use a key. Like, wow, he, that was scary <laughs> back then. Um, and another thing, you know, I said, I hope I get to all the W questions, but who adventure is for? I know we already decided that it's for everybody, um, but this is not what everybody usually thinks. You first. That's hard as a parent. You first. When you all shared your adventures before, did you think of an adventure that you helped someone go through? Or did you think of your very own adventure? It comes to that question, you know, like when, or what you're told when you're on an airplane, you gotta put your face mask on first before helping someone else. If you're not very good at this adventure thing, if you can't go through the ring of fire, if you have, you're having a hard time going through change, how can you help somebody else? You just really can't, you have to go first. And so many things I would never have done with my kids if I hadn't done it first without them there. I know that's hard to hear, but rock climbing, I didn't, I, I'm not gonna do that for the first time with my kids. That is scary. <laughs> but now I've done quite a bit of rock climbing and I have gone with my girls, actually by myself and my two girls, we've gone to Richmond to the quarry on Belle Island, set up our own rope and we did it. I never would have done that if I hadn't done it by myself first. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture in a second um, of something else I did with my girls. And I think it's important for them to have adventures too. Um, they are the ones that are going to be around when I'm not. We can have all the services in the world, but the people that matter the most to you are usually your family. So um, it's important for them to have adventures so they can help uh, the person in your life with a disability too. And of course everybody. But this is uh, one place I took my girls. I finally gave myself permission to take a vacation without Trey. That's tough. You know, my, my life, even when Trey was born, maybe even the first 10 years of his life, I thought we're always gonna do everything together. It's just what we do. He's not gonna be left out ever, ever for anything. I'm like, well, I've got two daughters that deserve to do things that push their limits too. And Trey doesn't always like the same things as his sisters do. If, if, if they were all typical kids, they wouldn't all be doing everything together all the time either. So uh, this was last summer, the first trip I took on vacation with my daughters without Trey. We went to Moab and it's an awesome place. And this is a climb that I had done one time before. It's called Looking Glass Arch and it's three pitches. Um, I was with my two daughters and this time I, I couldn't stomach it by myself. I'm not a lead climber, I got a guide. And I'm telling you, if, if it's the way to go. I mean, it takes so much stress off. So the guide's up there, you can see him there. And that is my daughter way out there. And it's a free rappel. It's one of the biggest free rappels in, um, I don't know, in the US, around there. It's about 200 feet. 
Um, it's long enough that you actually need two ropes to, to, to do that. Um, and you, cut, you go through that little keyhole right there. So when you, when you come down, you have to climb through that. Um, my youngest daughter especially was pretty scared. But she's like, I, there was no choice. Once we were at a certain point, you have to move on. There's like, no, you, you have to do it. Um, <laughs> it was pretty exciting. And she was 12 at the time. And there's lots of things like that that are accessible if you have a guide, if the people know, uh, you know, how, well, and I should even tell you when Chip and I did it, we were doing it on our own and we felt pretty comfortable doing it, but we were using all the protection that we felt was necessary, which I think it is. And then as we're getting to the second pitch, there's a guy just walking straight up with no ropes at all, just like, how, how, how's it going? <laughs> and we're videotaping like we're doing something epic. <laughs> and then there's some guy walking up, doo -doo -doo, like it's a sidewalk. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> everyone has their own adventure. And if you go to Moab, go do Looking Glass Arch. Um, it's important for you to do stuff like that too, uh, not just your kids. Uh, so I'm moving on to how. You know, we know what it is now. We know why it's important and who it's important for. You know, one of the best ways to get adventure in your life is to own up to your strengths and your weaknesses. And I saw John Coyle speak. He is a Olympic medalist speed skater. And he um, wrote a book called Design for Strengths. Great book. I would highly recommend that one also. Um, he, in short, got on the Olympic team. They wanted him to get better at something he wasn't very good at, but at the same time, it made him bad at what he was good at. So this is a fun activity that he did with the people in the crowd. Do you see any word up here that might be one of your weaknesses? You do? Okay, pick one or two, or however many you want. You know, you probably don't have as many as you think you do. Uh, does anyone need me to read these words? I was worried about that. I almost gave it as a handout. Disorganized, inconsistent, dramatic, perfectionist, dismissive, arrogant, self-indulgent, stubborn, obsessive, lenient, submissive, unfocused, gullible, dependent, emotional, slow, blunt, rude, inflexible, dogmatic, can't say no, rigid, critical, not a team player, unfeeling. There's a lot of weaknesses there. <laughs> uh, and I want you to look at the next slide. And I want you to pick out some of your strengths. There's creative, flexible, enthusiastic, entertaining, determined, motivated, compassionate, confident, patient, direct, and honest, disciplined, decisive, helpful, curious, devoted, collaborative, caring, detail-oriented, focused, caring, Analytical, practical, independent, and calm. Did you find one of those for yourself? Yeah. Okay, so here's the magic. If it worked, <laughs> you might have complementary <laughs> strengths and weaknesses. When you picked a weakness, did it match up with your strengths by chance? For mine, it does. I think I already told you my inner child was telling me, you can't be speaking. It's not going to be perfect. I'm a perfectionist. I hate that about myself. <laughs> but it's also a strength of mine. It means I'm detail-oriented. I do accounting for Support Services of Virginia. I can find a penny that's missing in a whole line of numbers. I'm really good at that. <laughs> but it means I'm a perfectionist, and sometimes I hold up the I hold up the process because I'm like, but wait, it's not perfect. And I know life doesn't have to be perfect, but my inner child wants it to be. Um, did anyone else have one that matched up? All of them. All of them. <laughs> you had all the weaknesses and all the strengths? No, all the ones that I picked as I Oh, good. Okay, then it worked. Did anyone have a strength that did not have the same corresponding weakness? Okay, well, the point being is a lot of times if, if you think something is a weakness, you might want to rethink that and see if you can turn it into a strength. 
For instance, I told you my perfectionist and detail oriented. Um, my son, you might be able to guess which one it is because unfortunately some stereotypes fit some of the time. Not to all the people all the time, but Trey is a little bit stubborn. But you know what? He's very determined. And that is a strength of his. Um, I've only got seven minutes. I got one more video I want to show you because <laughs> it shows how determined he is. And um, it's always my fear. Like, he's going to be stubborn. Like, I just know if he doesn't have the right things in place, we're going to shut down. We're not going to do it. But at the same time, if he knows what he wants, he is going to get it done. Um, so I think just reframing your strengths and weaknesses, knowing what they are, um, just it's the key, really is. Focus on the strengths, work around the weaknesses. You're probably never going to fix all your weaknesses. Maybe, I mean, you've, and what John Coyle says in his book is if you try to fix the weakness, you're also going to take away from the superpower. <laughs> you know, like you can't fix one and expect the other one to still thrive. Like they're, they're mirrors of each other. So consider that when you're thinking of yourself too and when you're thinking of the people you support. And uh, let's see how much I have to skip over to, uh, <laughs> you know, you got to know your strengths, know your weaknesses, work around them. Uh, so the picture of um, here is Chimney Rock. That's another place in Asheville, North Carolina. And it's, I guess, the thing I'm going to have to close with because I'm out of time. Um, but what he accomplished there was another thing that I was totally unsure about. His strengths are interesting. Like I said, he's determined, but he also loves to role play. Like, if he can have a part, like, it's great. Like, I'm going to pretend I'm a pirate today, so that's going to get me motivated to go to school for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's it's kind of cool. Um, he also tells time with his iPad. Uh, he's really great with devices. He can do any menu system. He's got, you know, can have five remotes and know which one goes to what and how to get to what he wants. Um, and music is really soothing to him. So on his iPad, he can get to whatever music he wants. He can see what time it is, and that's really comforting to him. Um, so this video I was going to show you, doo -doo 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 -doo. look at all this stuff I thought I would get through. Amazing. OK. Uh, <laughs> so we went to um, Chimney Rock. There, the reason I picked it, I'd actually seen it for a couple of years, it is a State Park, probably. I don't know, in Nashville. It's a, it, there's a lot, a lot of stairs to get to the top. Beautiful overlook, a really cool view. And it's just amazing. But the reason I picked it is because it also has an elevator. Yeah. Awesome. So if we weren't successful on the stairs, we can still get to the top and enjoy the elevator. And if you're not able to do the stairs, you can still use the elevator. It's, it's really a cool place. So we had a backup plan. Um, we knew, you know, what Trey can handle and not. And I'll show you what he did. And, you know, as we did each, some of the, the things we had to let him have control over was how fast we went. Like if he felt like I, you know, he would shut down if I said, come on, come on, come on, come on. We got to go. Like the girls are up there or whatever. No, it was like all in your time. We're going to do it. It doesn't matter how long it takes. If you want to take a break, that's fine. And so he chose when he wanted to take a break. He looked at his iPad and he'd say, well, um, I'm not going until the clock says 12. <laughs> and usually he was, he was pretty good about it. It was only about five minutes at a time. At the top, it was a little long, but it was a beautiful place to enjoy it. He said, I'm staying here until it says it's 12 o'clock. Like, OK, great. <laughs> you made it all the way. Who cares? Let's enjoy this. Um, so you can see how he handled that. I thought it was really worth um, the effort. Um, do we have just enough time for that? There's no words in this one. It's so pretty there. His sisters are proud of him, too. <laughs> That's Sadie.
He just said, this hurts, but he's still going. <laughs> But you'd miss out on that. They call this the subway. Oh. <laughs> There's a sign of the subway. You'd miss out on that. North Carolina. It's not too far away. <laughs> that guy turned around because he was too afraid. <laughs> it was kind of fun to get that on video. Do you think he was proud of himself? <laughs> Let me go all the way back down. <laughs> More stairs. More stairs. More stairs. More stairs. Keep going. Keep going. This is so good. Sometimes all you need is a little extra time. <laughs> True. Just Very true. He's got his iPod. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> iPad, I said iPod. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I hope you add some adventure to your life. And too bad I didn't get to everything. Yes, thank I don't you. know. <laughs> Would anyone else like a magnet? <laughs>